Good morning to everyone and welcome. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. After our first webinar in October on the numerical approach of sports performance, today we have the opportunity to welcome five international experts. The aim of this webinar is to share models of scientific support for elite athletes set up in various countries around the world. This conference will also be an opportunity to discuss the link between research and coaching with athletes and its impact on training practice. Five international well-recognized experts in the topic of sports science will present their approach to sports performance. We are particularly delighted with the international dimension that this conference has taken on and we warmly thank these international experts who do us the honor of taking part in this webinar. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gail Guillem, Head of Sport Expertise Performance Laboratory here at INSEP to introduce this morning session. Thank you very much, Adele, for your words and the kind introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you this morning and uh, to have the opportunity to open this webinar. Uh, we have a great lineup for this morning's session, and I join my colleagues to warmly thank our speakers and all INSEP teams and the team uh, of the Laboratory Sport Expertise and Performance for the smooth organization. Uh, the Tokyo 2020 countdown displays 120 days before the Olympics kickoff. Here at INSEP and all over the world, the pressure progressively increases. The staffs are working very hard to prepare and qualify the athletes of national teams in order to be a part of the 32nd edition of the modern Olympic Games era. And here in France, the IOC and Paris 2024 worked in close collaboration with relevant international federations to develop an updated venue master plan for the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Paris in three years from now. As you can see here, with important inputs also provided by the International Paralympic Committee and public stakeholders. As you can see on this slide, sports science is definitely anchored in Paris 2024 Olympics DNA. Today, 12 ambitious research programs dedicated to develop cutting edge knowledge in elite sport performance have been funded by the French Research Agency and some of the principal investigators are with us this morning and want to say hi to them uh, today. These initiatives participated to the emergence of a strong national network of sports science senior researchers and sports scientists prone to provide up-to-date support and expertise to, the, to elite sports stakeholders, staffs, coaches and athletes. Several initiatives participated to the development of this fertile environment among them, the GDR Sport and, Sport and Physical Activity, Science 2024, or the Great Insight. As another evidence of this new deal, the Agence Nationale du Sport recently started the Sport Data Hub, aiming to optimize individual and collective performance using aggregated data, research, and comparative analysis at national and international level. One year before the Olympics, we will be more than happy to welcome you all and the entire sports science community at the Palais des Congrès de Paris for the European College of Sports Science Congress. This will certainly be an exceptional opportunity to meet and share the results of these research programs, among others. Around four months before the Olympics kickoff, elite sports stakeholders face several major challenges that we hope Science Insights may help to tackle in 2021. First of all, the postponement of the Olympics and other major sports competitions disrupt the athletes' preparations, shake competition schedules, and impose athletes and staff to combat anxiety, preserve motivation, manage emotions, and define new objectives day by day. I hope we will address the question of whether psychology can provide useful knowledge to face these issues. On this topic, I am looking forward to listening uh, to Paul Winman talk in the end of the webinar, so please stay with us until the end. And second, the health crisis and the associated measures taken by the authorities to limit the virus propagation substantially changes the competition environment. Athletes and staffs are eager to benefit from medical and scientific input 
to adequately prepare athlete track from home to the competition facility. They also need to build strong organization to cope with this changing context. But we all know that deeper drastic changes are underway. The development of easy to use, light, less and less invasive sensors today allows to track athlete performance up to an embedded monitoring. The upcoming AI revolution also provides access to innovative key points of interest using aggregated data. The rise of such promising technologies may also expose staff to tech flooding and data overload. This context requires adapted organizations and resources to blast these challenges. In this particular and changing context, I hope we'll have the time to discuss the role sports scientists and analysts may play to help elite sports stakeholders adopting optimal strategies. But also, what would be the future for these experts and how high performance centers adapt their organizations to be able to propose up-to-date services and resources to the federations. As a webinar roadmap, we submitted these basic questions to our renowned speakers in a way of addressing three major stakes. First, organizations. Second, tech transfer and the art of applied science to impact performance. And finally, the links between research and practice, how bridging the gap between science and sports uh, which will be our first talk this morning by Adam in a few moments. Thank you all for being here with us this morning. Warm thanks again to our speakers, and I hope you will enjoy the session. Thanks, Gael. You should now be able to see on your screen the program of the webinar. From east to west, we will have the pleasure of listening to Adam Storey, Lead Strengths and Conditioning Specialist for Emirates Teams New Zealand and Canary Racing New Zealand. Then Katsuyoshi Shirai, Manager, Intelligence Group Operational Excellence Unit in Japan Heights Performance Sports Center. We will then welcome Nikolai Bulk, Coordinator Performance Service Olympic in the Olympic Training Center Berlin. Else Martz Liebeck, Head of Sports Performance and Research and Development at Olympiad Open, the Norwegian Elite Sports Center, and Paul Willman, Performance Manager, Performance Behavior in the Team NL Experts. We will be our last but not least speakers. You are more than 500 re registered and are currently uh, 200 following us on live on YouTube. This entire webinar will also be in replay on, you, on our YouTube channel in the next few days. Following the intervention of our experts, time will be dedicated to discussion. During your intervention, I invite you to ask your question through the live chat. It's Shenaid Kayo, sports and exercise engineer in our lab, accompanied by Gail Guillem, who will share them with you. Before we leave the floor to the first sp guest speaker, I wanted to express my warm thanks to Adrien Marc, with whom we co-organized this morning, Gail Guillem and Shenaid Kayo, the communication department, Nicola Belfayol, Diego Mila, and Leticia, Bela Leticia Bellardi, the audiovisual department, Bruno Loubière and Jean-Paul Cardo, Thierry Soler, Jean-François Robin, Bruno Rand, and Baba Kamir Tamaseb, which allowed us to organize this event. Without further ado, we will listen to our first speaker, live from the New Zealand, Dr. Adam Storey. Thank you, Adam, for being here with us despite the late hour at your home. Adam Storey, a specialist background in the, in the areas of strength and power development, has enabled him to work with multiple world and Olympic champions and within professional and international rugby union and sailing environments. Adam will discuss some of the research that he is currently leading at AUT University's Sports Performance Research Institute and how it influences the athletes and team that he work with. Adam, yeah, it's your you, turn. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so as Adele mentioned, so um, my chat will be around bridging the gap between science and sport and just, I guess, my perspective on how we do it uh, here in New Zealand and, and with the athletes and teams that I've worked with. Um, yeah, so just uh, again, very briefly, just to recap on my background, uh, I was primarily from a weightlifting background. So I was the former head coach for the New Zealand weightlifting team and uh, was very fortunate to head across to 
uh, two Olympic Games, uh, so that was London and Rio, and also two Commonwealth Games uh, with the team. Um, and I guess with that strength and power background, uh, I then moved on to take on a role as the national lead of strength and conditioning for Athletics New Zealand. Um, and that was a great opportunity for me to work with a number of fantastic athletes. And you can see pictured there that is uh, Dame Valerie Adams, who is our two-time Olympic Games gold medalist uh, for shot put. And she went on to win a silver medal in uh, Rio. Um, <clears throat> and then just moving on from athletics, I then I then took some time to work in, in rugby, so uh, specifically super rugby, uh, with the Blues, so I had a good role as a sports science manager and assistant trainer there. So it was a great learning opportunity for me to essentially move from individual athletes uh, or individual athlete campaigns to a team sport environment. Um, and then in 2019, I continued on with that rugby theme and I, I took on the role as uh, head of physical performance for Manu Samoa's Rugby World Cup in Japan, which again, to be able to work in an international uh, rugby setting with uh, test match level uh, players, it was it was a really great great experience, um, especially coming from New Zealand, we're absolutely mad about rugby. Um, and as Adele mentioned, I'm currently the national lead of strength and conditioning for Canoe Racing New Zealand, and primarily working with our sprint kayakers. So um, the athlete pictured there down the bottom is Lisa Carrington. So she's our current two-time Olympic champion from London and Rio, and she's definitely on track to defend her Olympic title for a third time in Tokyo if all things go to plan. And lastly, um, currently with uh, Emirates Team New Zealand as the lead strength and conditioning specialist um, there, so it's, it's a great experience to be part of. And just a bit of a recap, um, you know, if you're not too familiar with the America's Cup and, and Team New Zealand, mm -hmm. Uh, you can see here that um, you know we were very very fortunate to defend the America's Cup last week uh, here in New Zealand. So we originally won it back in 2017, um, and these uh, boats and athletes are a, a quite a unique specimen. So you can see in this aerial shot um, of our America's Cup boat, we've got a crew of 11 members, and eight of these members uh, in the crew are grinders. And primarily their role is to basically keep this, um, this beast of a boat uh, above the water on these hydrofoils. And so their, their workload um, involves grinding at sometimes very, very high resistances with low RPMs. Or conversely, throughout the course of a race, they'll be using light resistances at an extremely high RPM. So here's a bit of an example uh, video of myself uh, jumping in with one of the grinders just to get a taste of what they, they experience. Sorry about that. Play. Yeah, so for me, again, it was a good learning opportunity within that crew. Um, you know, we had seven Olympic medalists and 35 world titles within that crew of 11. So again, the wealth of experience uh, from these athletes was phenomenal and it was, it was great to be a part of. Um, and lastly, I've just got a research position at AUT University again, as Adele mentioned. So the um, unique thing about this position here is that we, uh, for our postgrad program, we're currently, well, we are based at our National High Performance Training Centre um, in Auckland. So at High Performance Sport New Zealand. So we've got a really good opportunity through the university to uh, conduct some good research with um, some top level athletes, you know, whether they're individual or team sport athletes. So it's it's really good for our students and it's also great for High Performance Sport New Zealand. So at um, HPSNZ or High Performance Sport New Zealand, we've got um, essentially, this is our structure that we roll with. So we've got three main branches, one being performance, one being athlete health and the other one being performance innovation. And you can see the areas that I'm primarily involved with are the areas highlighted in, in red. So um, S&C, where I'll be influencing the athletes that I work with um, from the physical performance perspective and also our AUT uh, research, which I'll conduct with my, my postgrad students. And that's probably falls under more of the performance innovation um, branch but the two very much marry up uh, quite nicely 
And when we when we try and formulate uh, any type of research program, we always um, bear these five five pillars uh, in mind. So they're always always critical in our thinking when we're trying to come up with that good um, research question and research proposal. So the first one being obviously performance. And what we mean by that is ensuring that each idea has a has a really good link to an actual medal. Uh, the next one is impact, and we want to be able to basically see uh, what uh, ability we've had to actually improve performance. So we don't want to just conduct research for the sake of research. We actually want to make a meaningful difference to the athlete or team. <clears throat> Priority is also then we look at, you know, where does that research project sit? Where does it sit with the athlete? Where does it sit with the coach and also the high performance director? So that will give weight how much time and emphasis and resource we put towards a, a specific research question. And at the end of the day, um, as much as we really, and, and me in particular, I really like to explore some of the anecdotal coaching evidence that exists. Um, you know, the majority of our, our research projects still have to be evidence-based driven. And lastly, uh, we need to have some champions. And what we mean by champions is we obviously um, would like to see improvements in athlete performance. But we also like to see uh, champions in the sense of new researchers uh, being developed uh, throughout the course of the journey as well. So the ne next few uh, sections, I'll just uh, have a get, provide an overview of some of the specific studies that I've done within the teams and athletes I've worked with. Um, and as I, as I said before, I, I, I like to look at some of the anecdotal coaching evidence because I think that's where the real gold nuggets uh, lie. And sometimes when we look at the current literature uh, regarding certain recommendations, um, there's quite a big contrast between what's happening in academia to what's happening in the real world setting. So one of the uh, projects uh, I conducted with one of my master's students while I was, I was at the, the Blues was, um, you know, what are the effects of repeated what bike sprints on a player's performance, in particular their horizontal power and power producing ability. And the reason that we uh, devised this research project was uh, basically, you know, in rugby, the players are sustaining a lot of injuries um, on a daily and weekly basis. So doing off-feet uh, conditioning, particularly on, on a watt bike, for example, is very common. Um, and it's a great way to obviously maintain their, their conditioning um, and body composition. But we wanted to see does it actually have a, a carryover effect to their on-field sprint performance as well if a player, for example, is stuck on a watt bike for a period of weeks? So in this investigation, we had essentially a control group, a watt bike group, or a treadmill group. And the key markers of performance uh, that we were looking for uh, was changes in 30-meter sprint time and also a repeated shuttle test. So that was basically indicative of their power endurance capability. And you can see just very briefly, over the course of a four-week training intervention, uh, the individuals were required to gradually increase the intensity uh, that they were working at. And you can see um, across a number of sets and reps, their overall workload was also increased progressively from week one to four. And another key variable which we really wanted to look at was you know, how this intervention could potentially change an athlete's force velocity profile. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, you know, with the force velocity profiling, um, we can basically calculate what an athlete's theoretical maximum horizontal force producing ability could be, and also what their theoretical maximum horizontal velocity could be. Uh, and then we can look at other aspects, like for example, what is their, the optimal velocity that elicits their peak power? And essentially what we can then determine is what does their athlete profile look like? Are they really force dominant with their horizontal um, actions or are they more velocity dominant? So those are some critical questions. And what we found out was uh, essentially that this watt bike intervention actually did positively improve uh, their horizontal force and power producing ability more so than a treadmill or a sprinting um, intervention. So it did add weight to our coaching staff that, hey, this is actually a really worthwhile um, training tool to use. The other thing that we're looking at, um, we get a lot of questions from other team sport athletes and coaches is, you know, the use of plyometrics. Um, and currently within the literature, you know, the, the literature recommends these huge 
ground contacts and huge volumes that athletes need to do, upwards of 400 ground contacts within a session. But in reality, that's, that's probably not what's happening. And, and what we wanted to do with one of my PhD students is we investigated this further. So we did a worldwide survey of 61 elite strength and conditioning coaches from multiple sports, from the NBA down to Major League Baseball to rugby, a whole different, whole different uh, cohort. And from all these international practitioners, what we found that is that 68% of them are, are really prescribing low volumes of plyometrics within their sessions, so less than 20 ground contacts. Um, and as mentioned, this greatly contrasts what's currently recommended in the literature around you know, plyometric training. So that um, survey has just recently been published in the Journal of, Applied, uh, sorry, uh, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. And then following on from Casey's uh, initial study, what we then wanted to do was we wanted to test these low volumes of plyometric training in a real world setting. So we essentially had two groups that underwent a reverse back to back three week uh, training period. So one group essentially did a horizontal based training program, first of all, for three weeks. They then had a 12 day washout period and then they went into a vertically orientated training program. The other group did the same thing, but in reverse. So they started with the vertical training program, 12 day washout, and then finished with a horizontal training program. And what we found was that the individuals that started with the horizontal training first, uh, they actually improved their 30 meter sprint time quite significantly. Uh, the individuals that started with the vertical training program first actually maintained uh, their 30 meter sprint time. So again, it's still a, a good outcome. And uh, as expected, the control group that did no plyometric training actually declined in performance across that six-week intervention. So a concluding finding of Casey's research was that, um, you know, even the, uh, the vertical plyometrics are really adding some good benefits in terms of that secondary acceleration phase, so that 10 to 20 meter split time. But ultimately, whether you're doing it horizontal first or vertical first, the key finding was that, you know, these ultra low volumes of, say, 20 ground contacts do actually provide a meaningful impact to uh, team sport athletes. And again, it was interesting because it really contrasts what's currently out there in the literature. And lastly, um, I just want to discuss what uh, one of my other PhD students, Dustin Aranchuk, has just recently finished up doing, and it's um, the use of eccentric quasi-isometric contractions. And the, the basis of this project really was spurred by a lot of our medical team uh, wanting to figure out ways that we can load our injured athletes um, in a safe and a really effective manner. So with these eccentric quasi-isometric contractions or EQIs, basically what they entail is getting an individual to hold a position until isometric failure and then by default, once a person reaches isometric failure and they can't hold that position any longer, they get, they get forced into an eccentric phase. Um, and then basically this prolonged EQI you know, builds up a massive amount of uh, time under tension and it actually improves um, a lot of things ranging from bit capacity to muscle size but also uh, connective tissue health as well. So from an application point of view, um, the exciting thing about EQIs is intensities even as low as 30% of 1RM are very useful in terms of training uh, and altering things like hypertrophy. Um, and again, because these contractions are so slow, they're submaximal, they actually hold a real good uh, place in terms of prehab and rehab context with elite athletes because they can modify tendon structures and they also provide a really important analgesic effect for these, these individuals as well. And lastly, um, what we found with these investigations is that the EQIs seem to trigger more so uh, morphological changes at the level of the muscle compared to neuromuscular adaptations. So with that being said, the, the best time to probably implement these EQIs is very early on in a periodized training plan. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned, and, and not only do they increase total training load uh, for in the injured athletes, you can also do them from a performance point of view. So here are just two very basic examples of how an EQI could work. You're holding a single leg leg press position for anywhere from 40 to 60 seconds until that failure point um, kicks in, and by default, you're forced into an eccentric contraction. 
So a similar kind of situation occurring with this heavy snatch pull as well. Yeah, so it's exciting stuff uh, from our perspective. And yeah, I guess a bit of, bit of questions if anyone's got some out there. Thank you very much, Adam, for the very, very interesting talk. Um, so now we will move on to the questions from the audience. Uh, I can to you. So, Adam, we've got one first question from Christoph. And the question is how to best manage expectations with research, which is by nature uncertain in terms of outcome? How often time, how much, often, sorry, often takes much time and is frequently focused on publications instead of solutions. I don't know if that was very clear. Um, yeah, yeah, so I guess uh, you're managing expectations. So I, um, it is interesting, so I wear, I wear two hats. So I wear one hat as an academic and one hat as a, as a practitioner. So um, I guess my, my priority is definitely trying to have some, some meaningful research where we can actually make a, a, a big impact on, on performance. So as I mentioned, sometimes our, our research, um, we, we do really try and contrast what's, what's in the literature. I think a lot of academics uh, can sometimes focus too heavily on li literary recommendations and then base a lot of their training interventions uh, solely on what's in literature. Um, but in reality, uh, and what we saw with our survey and what, what I see on a daily basis is the coaches that are working with these athletes directly, whether they're uh, sports-specific coaches or strength and conditioning coaches, they're doing stuff that is quite, quite different, but it's still so highly effective. So I think it's around um, making sure you've got the right research question that's going to be specific for that, that target population. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, that answered somewhat the question by Christoph. Your next question, Adam, is uh, what is your next what is your time distribution between su between support to athlete and research? Sorry, between the support to athlete and research. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, good question. So I would say I'm uh, my time difference is eighty. 80%, 20%, so 80% uh, practitioner and 20% uh, academic. So, um, yeah, I'm very fortunate uh, to be able to supervise masters and PhD students um, that are really invested in that strength and, strength and conditioning and exercise physiology space. So um, I'll have, always have a lot of questions, always have a lot of my own data that I need to get, um, get through. So it's really, really handy to have some some amazing students where I can um, basically help help them to formulate some good meaningful questions that will help not only the sport but obviously uh, provide them with some interesting stuff as well. Okay, so the next question is: uh, What are what skills do you think are essential to be able integrating staff as part of sports scientists? Yeah, that's that's a great question, um, and that's actually something I want to do, and I've discussed at our university is almost creating a uh, master's program around uh, high performance sport. So I think at the moment um, a lot of universities worldwide provide you know phenomenal stuff in terms of you know if you want to be a sports science specialist um, or a strength and conditioning coach, but sometimes some of the softer skills uh, really get missed out. And I think that that's where it comes down to. So, um, you know, people can can have the the brightest ideas, you know, the best looking resume. But at the end of the day, what I've found in, in working with elite athletes is how well you can build relationships with coaches and athletes is probably just as important, if not more important, than um, you know what your your IQ is or whether you've got a this degree or that degree, if that makes sense. So. That's where I want to take things with this potential masters in high performance sport is making sure that uh, these students will be getting the the theoretical understandings of what you need to be a sports scientist, but also understanding some of the softer skills and how to integrate all that to be a complete package. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Have I got time for another question? Two? Okay, so the phone question, Adam, is uh, do you have colleagues in other positions that can help you in transferring knowledge to this field? Uh, yes, I mean, I guess I guess that is, um, you know, New Zealand is a country of five million people, so uh, we're very small on on the scale of of you know other nations. So that we use to our strength because we're we're so small. We've got a very very tight knit community uh, across all sports, um, you know. So we can, uh, and, I, and I'm a huge huge believer in collaboration. So. Um, I'll have a lot of other colleagues that are either just straight practitioners and they'll have a, a question that, or a, a problem that they're trying to figure out, so then that'll help create a, a research project for us, or vice versa. Sometimes I'll just have my practitioner hat on and I need some help from a research point of view, so um, I'll collaborate with either different individuals from different institutions, um, even to the point where I'm, I'm currently co-supervising a PhD student over in uh, Victoria University in Melbourne. So, yeah, Australia, New Zealand. Again, we've got a, a good link there, so we we can reach and share a lot of information. So, um, yeah, I guess we're small, but we're we're very connected. Okay, uh, our following question is from Sebastian. In your experiences, what is the part of innovation proposed by scientists compared to coaches' requests of land? Sorry, you just just cut out on that last last bit there. Um, what is the part of innovation proposed by scientists compared to coaches' requests or command? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the uh, the perception of, of innovation um, is what I, what I I heard coming across there. Um, the yeah, I mean, uh, uh, some some of our coaches uh, really really buy into buy into the innovation. Some of our coaches um, again have been very very successful on the the world world and Olympic stage, but um, they they very much stick to what they've done uh, previously, and they, they don't want too much change. So again, I, I guess that comes down to some of the softer skills, like as a as a sports scientist or someone that's trying to implement some of this innovation. You sort of need to tread carefully at times because you don't want to be trying to trying to ram stuff down an athlete or coach's throat. Um, it does need to be very timely uh, because at the end of the day, like we all want to improve performance, but we don't want to be providing something that's going to be a big roadblock or a big distraction for an athlete or a coach. So it just needs to be quite tactical. So I hope I uh, I answered that one correctly from what I heard. Thank you very, very much, Adam. Uh, it is very enthusiastic and very impressive to see how, and uh, I, would, I would be very interested to, to know more about how you organize your time between research and practice. Uh, I think in, it, it's impressive that, that you have this ability to, to manage both activities, which, which is not very easy, and the fact that you are able to integrate staff to try to impact performance through, let's say, evidence-based practice. Uh, with publications and stuff, so it is very, very interesting. Thank you very much for for the great talk and uh, for having taken the time to, to answer the audience questions. Um, I think we will move on to our second speaker. Thanks again, Adam, uh, for your time. No worries. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I will give the end to, to Adam now. Okay. Thank you. We will now hear Katsuyoshi Shirai, lead of Sport Intelligence Group, Operational Excellence Unit in Japan Heights Performance Sports Center, who will present how sport information boosts science, scientific support in sports. Katsuyoshi, it's your turn. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, Great introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Katya Shirai, manager of Intelligence Group in Japan Hypermass Sports Center. First of all, I want to say thank you to INSEP for inviting me as a speaker to this conference. It's a great honor to present at your conference. I hope my presentation will give you some insights to your work. 
So uh, that one of my presentation, uh, presentation is pros. Uh, at first, I'd like to introduce myself and my team. And then I will talk about two examples of how sports information has boosted sports scientific support in Japan. First, let me introduce myself. I've been working at the Japan Sports Council for 20 years. In 2001, the Japan Institute of Sports Science has established and I became a member of JISS as a researcher in, in the Department of Sports Information. At that time, my main job was to take video during the games and provide games analyzed data. On the right side in this photo, you can see, see me at the Athens Olympic Games 2004. On the left side is Dr. Kirome, who is now the Director General of GISS. At the time, he was a wrestling coach and I was providing him video of the games. Uh, from 2016, I became a manager of sports innovation department. And 2018, I also became a manager of intelligence group. This figure shows the organization chart of Japan High Performance Sports Center. There are six departments in Japan High Performance Sports Center. GISS includes science, medicine and research department. Intelligence group is a part of the uh, operational excellence unit. Next, I'll introduce you the activity of intelligence group. Activities of intelligence group are to gather, analyze, and provide information to Japan High Performance Sports Center, Japan Sports Agency, and National Sports Federations. We gather information from open sources mainly. Sometimes sports scientific support team are called the team behind the team. So if I explain our team in one sentence, intelligence team is a team behind the team behind the team. From here, I would like to show two examples of how sports information have boosted sports scientific support. This figure shows medal winning rate of medal potential athletes of the top 10 countries at Beijing 2008 Olympic Games. We define medal potential athletes as top eight ranked athletes, pairs, and the teams in the World Championships before the Olympic Games. In 2008, compared with upper-ranked countries, Japan's medal winning rate was significantly lower. Why was Japan's medal winning rate so lower compared to other countries? We thought that was due to the limitation of the Olympic Games format. For example, number of accreditation cards are limited for each national delegation. So sometimes sports science and medicine staff were cut off from delegations. Also, the time allowed to train in Olympic venue is limited, and it is difficult to have enough training during before Olympic Games. Moreover, in the Olympic dining, Japanese foods are not provided. So athletes had to play in the Olympic format, which was not the best environment for their performance. It's difficult to change the Olympic performance, so when I asked one of the strengths and condition staff in GISS, can we support athletes during the Olympic Games? He replied, no, we can't. Our support for athletes is completed just before athletes be leave for Olympic Games. 
other country might have the same problem, and our question was, did they give up supporting their athletes as well? They did not. We found some approaches used by other countries in the website news. One solution was to set up a support train center locally for athletes, coaches, and staff. This slide shows the United States High Performance Training Center that was set up for the Beijing Olympic Games. And the other news shows that Australia has also set up Australia Recovery Center. Both countries have a high medal winning rate than Japan. So we decided that we will set up a support center for Japanese athletes in London 2015, like United States and Australia. This picture shows, shows you the Japanese support center in Rio 2016. Japanese meals were provided by the same company that is catering at Japan High Performance Sports Center. So athletes can eat their meal with the same taste, quality, like in Japan. Some weighted training machine of Japan High Performance Sports Center were provided as well. Also, Japanese people love to take a bus, but athletes village often do not have bus stop in each room. So big jet bus was an important point to decide which for. Uh, which facility to set up support centers. This figure showed the number of medals and the medal winning rate of medal potential athletes in 2008, 12, 16. That bar shows number of medals and the blue line is medal winning rates. Number of medal uh, number of medal in Beijing was 25. London was 38 and Rio was 41. 41 is the best ever for Japan. Medal winning rate in Beijing was 20%. London was 32% and Rio was 33%. After Beijing, number of medal, medals have increased because of the improvement of medal winning rate of medal potential athletes. Of course, setting up support center is not a single reason of this improvement, but it is natural to think that it is one of the re main reasons. It is interesting that the support we provide for athletes in support center was almost the same of what we do in Japan. The difference in a difference in place and timing of support made positive impacts for performance of Japanese athletes at Olympic Games. If we don't gather other countries' information, we could not have an idea to set up support center around Olympic Village. Japan is located at the Far East, and we are an island, and not to be everyone influent in English. So naturally, often we do not catch the latest information on the high performance sport, uh, around high performance sport. You have to keep gathering and update our information. I would like to share our second example quickly uh, about COVID-19. COVID-19 is a pandemic that, was, that we have never experienced. Organizations, coaches, and athletes have been looking for the best way to train or to operate training center. We, intelligence group, collect any kind of information which could help us establish safe environment. During this period, we proactively gathered information from European football and U.S. professional sports, which is a new challenge for us because we usually focus on just Olympic and Paralympic sports. One of our 
One of the output is the Japan High Performance Sports Center guideline to restart training during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many national sports federations used our guideline as a reference when they developed their own. Fortunately, we have not had any cluster of COVID-19 in Japan High Performance Sports Center. We provide information about nutrition, mental condition, physical fitness testing, and so on, on the website. Our website got around 50,000 pages view in the first two months, April, May 2020. Especially train movies had got 20,000 accesses. We hope this information is useful for athletes in Japan. In conclusion, we believe that sports information has boosted sports scientific support in Japan, as I showed example on my presentation. In 2005, JSS had been established and Department of Information was included. That was a part of a positive power to raise performance of Japanese athletes. We if we do, did not have information department, it would be difficult for Japan to stand and keep the position we are in. Even during this pandemic, we hope to actively engage in sharing our knowledge and experience with other con uh, countries to make our sports environment safe and performance enhancing. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Katsuyoshi, for a very interesting talk again. <clears throat> um, I think we'll now move on to the questions of the audience. Shinaid, please. So our first question is from Gail. Uh, what is the medical conversion rate expected in Tokyo this summer? <laughs> Uh, because uh, this um, pandemic situation uh, makes uh, any change of uh, middle conversion rate, uh, so it's difficult to define or I expect what, what our um, middle wing rate is, is in Tokyo 2020, but uh, we expect um, the Olympic game is a hosting game, so I hope the middle wing in a winning rate will be uh, a bit, uh, larger than ever Olympic game. Okay. Our next question is from Sasha. And the question is, how do you assess the medal conversion rate? Is there any other metric you could think of to keep track of athlete support? Not there. Oh, uh, we uh, we collect uh, collecting the data of medal poten potential athletes every year. Uh, every year, I watching the World Championship and count the number of top eight ranked athletes, and uh, we always uh, watching the number of uh, medal potential athletes. And the uh, middle conversion is, is calculated from uh, what the number? Divide. Hmm? divide. Divide. Um, uh, we divide the um, number of middle uh, winning um, number of middle from middle potential assets uh, to uh, from hmm? from Nanda. Sorry. We calculate from the uh, number of medals from a uh, medal potential assets and cut uh, divided medal potential assets. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got one more question from Antonio. How recent 
advance in technology and computational tools are impacting the way your intelligence team works? Maybe to repeat? Yes, uh, mm, we're collecting latest news from uh, all over the world, mm, uh, new technology which apply to hypermass sports, and we have a mm, division which are mm, developing, a, developing a new material and the mm, tools that helps for uh, hypermass sports, but uh, that is a you know that is a top secret, so I cannot tell about it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Katsuyoshi, uh, for thank you. the time to answer the questions. Uh, I hope the communication is okay because we had a delay between uh, your slides and uh, the vision on YouTube, but uh, I think everything was quite smooth, so thank you very much. Um, for again, the very enthusiastic talk on uh, another topic regarding data, even if everything cannot be um, showed on the screen, uh, I hope that uh, what you provided at uh, the audience to better understand what uh, Japan built for for the next Olympics. And uh, uh, I hope everything is fine in Tokyo. Uh, thanks for your time again, Katsuyoshi. And uh, we now move on to our next speaker. Thank you. I turn over to Dr. Nikolai Bulk, which is currently the coordinator of performance yeah. service at the okay. Olympic Training Center in Berlin since 2014. Nikolai will give an overview of the different institutions offering support in the German sports system, highlighting which strategic and operational mechanisms are in place to achieve the goal of providing integrated and performance-focused elite support sports services. Nicolai, it's your turn. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, for being here. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me and you can see my slides now? We hear you, we see you, but and we see your slide. It's perfect. Okay. Cool, then I can start. So uh, again, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And what I'm going to do is basically offering you a very long sprint through the research and uh, service network for lead sport in, uh, in Germany. I'm going to talk a little bit about the roles of the different players we've got in our system. Um, I, once we know the players, I'm trying to talk, give a rough idea how the processes and the management work, how the players especially get their tasks and funding. Um, then uh, coming into the back bend um, and trying to give the German system a little bit of a reality check um, and then come to the finish line um, with uh, one or two examples from my daily work to show you what it feels like uh, when the system seems to work. But uh, before I get there, basically as a little bit of a warm-up, I just want to put four things out as a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, first of all, I'm only going to talk about the um, sport science support or a support service infrastructure we have in Germany. And I think um, it goes without saying, um, this is not winning medals. The athletes and the coaches are winning medals. And without having dedicated athletes and knowledgeable and inquisitive coaches, um, these service and support structures um, don't um, will also not deliver. Uh, I think this is something to keep in mind. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about uh, the situation of the German system as I uh, work with it uh, today. Um, there is a lot of change going on in the German elite sport system, uh, especially how the support system is working and managed. 
So if you would hear me talk again in half a year's time, it might be a di different picture that I'm giving. Uh, thirdly, I am working currently at the Olympic Training Center here in Berlin. Uh, so I'm working in a frontline institution. I will give you a frontline view of what it feels like to work in uh, the German elite sports system. Um, if you would have somebody speaking from uh, with a boardroom view from the German Sport Confederation or high up the um, the strategic hierarchy, uh, the picture might also be a, be a little bit different than what I can give you today. And finally. Um, I will try to draw a bit of an international comparison and I do this uh, under the big headlight that any type of international comparison when you look at sports systems you have to do very carefully to draw any conclusions what works better in one country might not be the solution for another country it's uh, highly embedded in the social cultural context. Uh, sport is organized. So without further ado, um, getting to the start line, talking about the players and their roles in the German uh, sports science support infrastructure for elite sport. Um, first of all, um, starting with an organization I also represent, we have something called Olympiastützpunkte or Olympic Training Centers. We've got uh, 13, respectively 17 of them distributed all over Germany uh, when you count in the uh, regional hubs. Um, our job is to deliver the well-known internationally established elite sports support service package uh, from medical support over lifestyle support uh, to training science support. We do this to athletes and coaches in our respective region. So uh, that's the useful thing of being spread around in, in Germany quite a bit. So we reach the, uh, the athletes where they live, but also we join athletes and coaches when they go to training camps and competitions and help out there. The second um, level of uh, support comes from two national applied working research institutes. This is uh, first and foremost the IAT in Leipzig, the Institute of Applied Training Science, uh, and their role is basically to, though their main role is basically to support uh, the elite sport practice with applied research and innovation projects and development work. Um, on this training science, sports science spectrum. Then secondly, we've got the FES, um, the Institute for Research and Development of Sport Devices, which is based here in Berlin. And they have got a similar task spectrum, but they focus primarily on, uh, what their job is to focus on engineering projects, so building boats, building bikes, and measuring technology. Both of these institutions uh, have a clear role to play as in um, they get their insights and their their tasks from the front line of elite sport practice. Um, as opposed to um, over 60 university-based sports science programs uh, or sports science institutes, uh, they are the classic academic research. They have got the classic academic research interests and focus. Their work is very much theory-driven, uh, academic field-driven, method-driven, which have been established at these, at these institutions. So very uh, the classic um, academic way of approaching sport. But we have to, uh, of course, uh, say um, there are also some established links with some ex uh, institutes and uh, institute representatives who actually have got also their polls at the uh, front line of elite sport practice. So these are the players, uh, and I think this came also through in, uh, in Adam's presentation. Between those types of players, you've got the spectrum of us at the top, um, not hierarchically, just on, uh, on, on the slides. Uh, we bring the performance mindset and do the daily consultancy work. And at the bottom, at the foundation part, you've got um, the partners working with a more scientific rig rigor. They add new ways of thinking and they are more driven with this why mindset, uh, trying to understand how things work. Um, or maybe this is also familiar with you guys. Um, uh, 
we are driven by for performance questions and uh, the colleagues at the universities are mainly driven by research questions. Okay, um, I think now the, the players are introduced, uh, the race is on. The next question is um, how does the process work? How do the, um, especially how do the players uh, get their jobs and resources? Um, first and foremost, um, starting at the bottom, like in all other countries, uh, we've got private funding avenues and especially uh, official um, formal research councils uh, where especially universities can apply for funding um, um, this is probably an avenue um, which is uh, in, in existence in most other countries as, as well for us, especially on the Olympic uh, elite sport. And this is more or less irrelevant uh, or we can't rely on funding via um, basic science research councils to um, support our work um, or we won't find big sponsors to, fi uh, to um, support our work. Which is probably probably a bit, little bit special about the German context, context is that we have the Federal Institute of Sports Science, which is like a sports science research council. Um, so here, universities, research, especially university and research institutes, they can uh, bid for funding sports related for sport related projects and yes they do have uh, also an elite uh, elite sport focused funding streams um, um, so elite sports focused research can be financed via this avenue especially at universities um, and yes they are starting to listen more to us practitioners in shaping their funding streams and uh, granting um, the financial support but for us um, on the daily uh, on the daily service delivery end, uh, this is also not relevant. Um, for us, relevant where basically what pays my bill that's a system and my bills is the system of as a system of cooperation agreements between the national governing bodies and uh, the Olympic Training Centers, the IAT in Leipzig and the FAS. Um, this process is managed by the uh, German Sport Confederation and financed respectively confirmed at the end by the German Ministry of Interior and and this process I'm trying to have a closer look now um, and here I come back to my disclaimer at the beginning um, this is the the big at the heart of how our system work, works and this is also something which is currently under um, development so this might well look different in half years time so I'm going to give you a nutshell view of how the system works up to now. So first step is uh, the German Sport Confederation meets up with each and every each national sport federation like for example the athletics federation or the swimming federation and they have uh, something which used to be to uh, called target agreement talks or now they are called structural talks um, they basically sit together and agree every four years uh, what's the strategy of um, a sport federation, where are they at the moment, where are they going to be in four years time, how successful do they want to be at the next Olympic Games. Um, and how do they, are they going to achieve this? Where do they base their athletes? How often do they go to training camps? Uh, and so on and so forth. And once this is signed off, uh, then we meet we meet this group or we join this uh, conversation as the Olympic Training Center, the IAT and the FES and um, we then offer our services respectively the National Sport Federation then says from the Olympic Training Center in this region I would like to have for this training center this type of support and from this Olympic Training Center when I go to training camps I would like to take a physiotherapist and a biomechanist with me to training camps or to competitions. Okay and this is kind of setting the scene how we um, how I get my budget and um, how I get my task spectrum defined and um, then this then goes used to go to the Ministry of Interior uh, and they then said okay we can 
pay for this or we, can, we can't pay for this. Now, what is changing now is that the Ministry of Internal Affairs is, uh, of Interior is also looking to be more and more part of the planning process and trying to um, understand more and more why decisions, funding decisions are made and how well they were made. And for this, they have developed uh, another commission called Potters, which is joining the structural talks now. This is going to happen in the next few months for the next Olympic cycle. So uh, wait and see. I, I, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out over the next couple of months. Now, so I've introduced the players. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the process and the management of the system. Now coming to the uh, back end, to the uh, painful 300 meters, uh, a bit of a reality check. Um, and we've heard Adam talk this morning. We will hear uh, colleagues from uh, from New Zealand. We will hear uh, colleagues from Norway. Um, overall, I would say uh, when we look into and uh, we heard from Japan. Overall, uh, I would say my, it's my perception that the type of support services we offer doesn't differ between countries anymore. We all deliver sports science support. We all deliver lifestyle performance support. We all have got a, a, a network of medical experts. We've got, all got intelligence units somewhere in the background. Um, so this is the, the, the what we do is no longer a big differentiator. And probably I would think how the resources which are available are distributed in the system is also rather similar uh, because at the end of not rocket science we are planning with a four-year horizon planning horizon and at the end of the day uh, the resources have to be distributed and planned uh, so i think this is uh, this is pretty much the same uh, or similar in most countries the painful question is for me a little bit uh, how much money is poured into the system and especially where this money ends up. And for this, um, I would like to use a little informal to show a little bit what, where we are standing in Germany at the moment, uh, an informal number game. Um, my boss, uh, Dr. Harry Bear and me did in, for a presentation in 2017, 2018. And we had a look at the German elite sports system at the time and um, the English Institute of Sport set up um, in, um, in England. And uh, we, with publicly available uh, resources, we try to figure out, uh, first of all, how many practitioners are involved in the two systems. And to be honest, it's roughly the same. Um, so the, the, the manpower delivering support to athletes is about the same. Uh, now looking at how many training centers this, the, the system has to cater for, this is starting to become a little bit more painful as in, the, in, in England they, these practitioners have, are concentrated around 36 national training bases and in those days we were counting 250 in Germany. This is going down but we are still not yet so focused with where our people or our athletes are. And finally, and this is also explainable, um, where, how many athletes do we support in, in England or in the UK sports system? At the time, it was about 2,200. We were beyond 4,000. Also, this has come down uh, in Germany, but still, it's uh, a bigger system to be catered for. Now, this is this is the grand scheme of things when you, we focus down a little bit more on um, what it feels on the front line, actually the pain actually only becomes really apparent. So looking at our training center here at the time in Berlin, we employed 25 full-time practitioners. Today we have got even less. We cater for 450, 450 national athletes. This is about the same still today across 20 different sports. Uh, so we've got 18 athletes per one full-time equivalent position while working across many sports. And at the same time, uh, we were able to do a comparison with two national, international sport programs uh, abroad. And from that exercise, we know in those systems, there were 
eight to maybe even only four athletes per full-time equivalent uh, catered for in one sport. And as I said before in my disclaimer, it is difficult to draw comparisons between different sports systems, but this is currently the the challenge um, I think the German sports system is, uh, is facing, uh, the, the, the density of support, the tightness of support we can offer to our athletes is just no longer competitive on the international stage. Um, and with this painful look on the international comparison, we're coming to the finishing straight, uh, and um, I still want to leave you with uh, five examples, where, or four examples, where actually um, you can complain as much about the system, which will never be perfect, as systems will never be. We can still make it work, uh, and um, a little bit like Adam, I'm a part from being the coordinator here of the support systems. I'm also a strength and conditioning consultant and coach here at the Olympic Training Centers. And I've just um, put up uh, three pictures here from athletes I'm working with for a few years. I'm working together with um, uh, I'm working together with uh, two divers, uh, Christina and Elena Wassen, uh, for more than a good year, I'm working together with a sprint cycling coach as a consultant to his strength training, Ike Pocorni, and I'm also working with a track cycling athlete, uh, a track cycling endurance athlete, Theo Reinhardt. Uh, and these are uh, the moments where we make our system work uh, and what I think comes together when we are able to use the re our resources in a way to uh, gain a performance impact. There are five things that come together. First of all, we've got dedicated athletes. And here I would like to again to mention Christina and Elena. Um, they, they are dedicated in, dedicated in a way that they... Um, don't necessarily enjoy being in the gym, uh, but they over the years we we uh, they learn to appreciate uh, that even though they don't enjoy it, it's an important part of their training. And we uh, we set up a system that they today can even when they are out on training camps, they are basically self-sufficient in their training. Um, we need trusting coaches. Again, with here, I would like to refer to Ike Pocorni. Uh, I don't work with his athletes directly. He basically um, uh, he basically uh, came to me and just said, I would like you to give us some advice on how to change how we are working uh, uh, in the gym. And he took this advice and completely changed his approach to weight training a bit on that. Um, then uh, again, this is going back to what Adam said at the beginning. Uh, it's important to have a service team and team player in your practitioner team in the background. This is uh, for us as as we have so little resources, super important. Uh, with all of my athletes, I'm working especially tight with a physiotherapist. Uh, and because we don't have so many resources, we have to be relatively clear with each other who's doing what job and who's looking after what problems. And uh, this team working experience is really important um, when the resources are so tight. Uh, and at the end, uh, yes, when you, we sometimes manage to publish a little bit of our work, it's important to um, find scientists who understand uh, and collaborate with scientists who understand the nature of our very unique environment. And last but not least, uh, coming back to the shortness of our resources, we have to have uh, patient families at home to make this all work. Uh, and with this, um, I think I come to the end of my sprint around the German sports system and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikolai, for this uh, very uh, clear overview of the system and also very uh, key points, messages for the audience. It was very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. The, the athletes and the coaches uh, win the medals and uh, we are there to, to help them. And uh, thank you very much for your last slides too the message of uh, being very clear of who's doing what I think okay so thank you thank you again and thank you also for for the first slide and the and the disclaimer um, I think uh, we will uh, shortly move on to the questions uh, maybe we have uh, just lost the connection 
with uh, Nikolai, so I'll just wait for my technical team to confirm that we have Nikolai with us still. Okay, so we'll need just a short moment to, to come back with uh, Nikolai. Connection has been lost, so you have a short break for a coffee or to think about uh, the best question that, come, that comes to your mind uh, before we, we give the floor again to Nikolai. So we have several questions from the audience. Uh, again, I just wait that uh, Nikolai comes back with us. Cannot see you and I cannot hear you either. Okay, so okay, okay, so I think we will move on to the. Ah no, Nikolai is back. Can you hear me, Nikolai? We have you on the screen, but can you hear me now? Do you know when I when my feet cut out? After you're finished. Yeah, just okay. at the end of your talk. Oh yeah, and, uh, I and I, it took too out. long. I'm very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think it's it, it was it was again very interesting. Sorry for the technical issues and sorry to the audience for for these technical issues. Uh, so now we will move on to to the to the questions. Fine to you. How are support demands processed and ordered in terms of priorities? Okay, I'm going to leave the um, teams. Uh, I think the problem is resolved. So, um, else, do you hear us? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, perfect. So, now I present you Else Smart Liebeck, Head of Performance and Research and Development at Olympiad Open, former Olympic champion, Olympic bronze medalist, world champion, and European champion in team handball. Else, we'll present the Norwegian way to support athletes and coach and how they integrate sports science into this multidisciplinary work to further development. So now, Else, it's your turn to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. Um, we are living in a strange time. Uh, as you uh, all over the world, we are uh, coping this uh, COVID situation. And uh, what I will tell you today is uh, is our normal way to service uh, how we give service to our athletes and coaches, but uh, it's it's more or less the same in the situation we are now. Um, I will give you an overall uh, view of Olympia Open and how we work, uh, how we work with the coaches and the athletes, and uh, main pillars. We are uh, our core tasks. I will present them and. Uh, I will try to link this to the research and development we are doing. Uh, Olympia Toppen is uh, the elite sport department at the Norwegian Sport Federation. We are uh, a part of the Norwegian Sport Federation and the uh, Olympic and uh, Paralympic Committee. Uh, so uh, in Norway, we have all the elite sport and uh, the rest of the sport under the same umbrella. Um, we are uh, overall. We have the overall responsible uh, responsibility for the um, 
uh, results in the Norwegian elite sport. But the federations themselves, they are responsible responsible for their own sport. Our vision is to lead and train best in the world. And we are working together for the big performances. That is our philosophy. Uh, we are working with uh, 28 different sports. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a scholarship for about 300 athletes so it's um, it's um, less than the German weight yes I would say uh, I said something about Olympia Teppen and how we are organized and that we are a lead sport department in the Norwegian Sport Federation and Olympic and Paralympic Committee and we have uh, seven uh, regions around uh, across Norway uh, the regions they are working mainly with the the talent development. So here in Oslo, we are working with the national teams and their coaches and um, and supporting the athletes preparing for Tokyo and Beijing, both Olympics and Paralympic athletes. So. Um, this is a screenshot from the greatest sporting nation uh, per capita. We have been on the top for many years. Uh, we are only 5.5 million uh, people in Norway, so we are quite quite few compared to the other nations uh, presenting here. Uh, last year was a special year, uh, so we got also high in the Global Cup uh, uh, ranking. But uh, it will be interesting now to see how we are doing in Tokyo and next uh, games in uh, the Winter Games in Beijing. Winter has been our, uh, our uh, uh, biggest success. We are a winter sport nation. We are born with skis on our feet, we used to say. And uh, we in Pyeongchang, we got uh, 39 uh, medals, so it will be a uh, difficult to reach those uh, medals in Beijing, but we are, uh, we are uh, on a good way to preparing for those games. In Tokyo, we hope to double the amount of money, from, not money, but uh, medals from uh, Rio. Uh, we got only four medals, which were uh, disappointing for us in uh, Rio, and we are hoping to, to get uh, at least eight medals in the Olympic Games in Tokyo. The Paralympics uh, Games, we are uh, we don't have that much, uh, many athletes, but we are uh, trying to um, support them as best as we can. And we had a very a big uh, sponsor uh, now to support our work with the Paralympic uh, athletes. So we are very much uh, uh, looking forward to see how we can... Um, transfer this into uh, good results. The goal for the Norwegian elite sport is divided into three different uh, areas. Or, uh, of course, the important thing and most important thing uh, is to make the best athletes even better. Uh, that mean, which means we are working with uh, the top athletes and the uh, top teams, national teams. Uh, we want to develop more athletes uh, at the international level, and uh, we have this uh, to develop elite athletes for the future. So we have to concentrate on all these three areas to get uh, elite, uh, top elite uh, athletes uh, in the future games. So this is uh, something about our philosophy, working together with the... Um, to achieve a great performance. We are working very, very uh, much across sports. We are a very small country. Uh, so uh, in uh, our Olympic Center, we have all the sports uh, in um, training together, doing a lot of things together in our training center. Of course, they have different uh, uh, plans and they have uh, competitions and so on. But uh, our team, uh, the expert team, uh, which consists of about 40 people here in Oslo, we are supporting the athletes and their national teams 
uh, and uh, also supporting uh, different athletes and teams in different uh, yeah and they are all train also training uh, a lot together so uh, like uh, an example of that could be the rehabilitation uh, which now we have a group of um, eight to ten uh, knee injuries and they are training together here to to uh, perform to get their health back and uh, and prepare for the their arena so athlete support the athlete is always in the center for our work I think it's uh, it's the same thing as it is, as it is uh, across uh, across uh, uh, the and for all of you across the world um so these are our uh, expert fields we have uh, endurance sports psychology strength and power technology motoric skills sports coaching nutrition and health and also dual career and all these things has to fit uh, to um, to the individuals and to the individual uh, athletes to the teams and to the uh, coaches, and uh, we are working in teams with the, all these uh, experts groups. To and we make plans and we prepare them. And uh, you see the bottom right. We have the research and development. I will tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, how we can uh, fit this into all these uh, expert fields. Our core tasks are to strengthen quality of daily training, relationships in the performance teams, and competition preparation and uh, execution. So all things we are doing, uh, we have to concentrate uh, around these three things. Uh, quality of daily training. Uh, here is a picture from our training center in Oslo, where you can see uh, a Paralympic group working on the bottom right, uh, top right. Uh, we have some uh, athletes uh, groups and other fields, and th this is how we work. Where we work uh, together, and uh, uh, the athletes they are uh, using Olympiad Open as a meeting place, and to inspire and to uh, move forward in the um, in their training. I will talk more about this relationship in the performance teams because that is uh, a unique uh, or that is very important for us. And I think this is, uh, this is something we have worked a lot with. Um, and it has been very important now during this uh, uh, pandemic time. Uh, we are not only um, concentrated about uh, the expertise themselves. We are also, for us, it's very important that the people, that the ex experts, that they uh, have the ability to build trust and to build uh, good relationships to the teams and to the athletes, because I think we think that is a, a main pillar in our work. Um, so, uh, and during this uh, difficult time, or the difficult last year, it has been even more important because uh, the re relationships uh, have been more uh, uh, have been fewer around the athletes. So those who are very close to the athletes, uh, they are more than experts now. Um, one example of how we work with the uh, coaches here is the Elite Coach Program, which it's a program we have for the coaches. It's not about uh, uh, making training plans or uh, strength uh, training. It's more about uh, uh, how they deal with the uh, athletes, how they uh, involve the athletes, how they uh, work with the athletes to get them uh, motivated and and here, uh, top coaches from different sports meet and have this program. They discuss, they will reflect, and they uh, get um, tasks they have to do in their own teams. And they are also mentoring each other, and they working with the experts to develop uh, further. And the last 
the core task is competition, preparation, and execution. Of course, that it is a very important uh, uh, area as well. And it has been even more important, I think, the last years. And we see that uh, with technology and uh, it's uh, a lot of doors that opens. Um, it's a lot of possibilities. Uh, and uh, we are dealing more and more with that and to try to help the national teams and the athletes. Um, and this, uh, I, I will give you here an um, example of how we work at the para research and development, the para field. Uh, over the last year, we got this uh, new uh, sponsor and we have now designed a, a research project which uh, includes uh, para equipment, para health, para training, and para knowledge. Uh, and we work. We are working with um, uh, research centers and researchers across uh, Norway uh, with the with the best uh, experts in these fields. We have the Oslo Oslo Sports Trauma Center, which is uh, uh, well very well known. We have the um, Center for Elite Sport Research. And the unique thing, unique thing about this is that the athletes, the coaches, the experts, and the researchers, they are working in the same uh, hub, more or less. So the researchers, can, for example, this week, we had a researcher from uh, working with para equipment together with the para alpine team. And they had good uh, conversations and they tried out new equipment. And they are now working, uh, giving feedback to the new uh, new equipment, and they're working very close together to get this uh, uh, development. And this is how we work in the different fields. And uh, that could be an advantage for us. We don't have that much money for research, but working very close with the uh, with the research centers and the researchers. We can uh, identify and we can translate the research into practice. And I think this is how we all want to uh, work and use our money at the best way, not only to find some answers on questions that are not relevant for the athletes, but uh, we have to be very uh, focused on, uh, on how we prioritize. So uh, I'm not sure how about uh, my time, but I'm see I see that uh, I think that Paul is uh, waiting. I want to say thank you. We had some technical problems in the beginning, so it was a little bit uh, um, difficult in the start. But I I hope you get a short glimpse of how we are working in Norway, and uh, um, I think. The most important thing to say is that we are different countries and we are different organized and we we uh, have to adjust our system to to how uh, to it's, so it's an individual individual system but uh, we can also get inspired of how other of how other countries are working. So uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, if you wanna if you wanna contact me you have my uh, email address here, or you can find me at uh, the Olympia Toppen uh, website. Thank you very much. Thanks again. I think that even if we have uh, different contexts between countries, I think we have also similarities between France and, uh, and Norway, because in Oslo we have this unique uh, context in which science and uh, in the NIH and uh, the Olympia Toppen are very close, so it provides opportunity for collaboration as you, you showed in the end of your talk, so I think we can address interesting discussions and uh, questions that we also have here in France. So thank you again. I think we'll move on to the questions. Uh, Shnaid? Hi, Els. So our first question is from Leah. As an athlete, athlete yourself a few years back now, um, now that you're on the other side, which advice would you give to sports scientists for them to have a real impact on the field? Uh, oh, that would be to uh, not complicate the questions, to make the questions even simpler. And uh, it can, I think, it for an athlete, it can't be 
simple enough. You have to be a very good translator as a researcher, or uh, you have to you need a translator if you have difficult questions. So uh, if you uh, if I see that now that uh, the researchers that are um, having a, the biggest impact on the athletes or the athletes training, they are uh, they are very good at the simplifying difficult questions. Okay. So our following question is, um, what are the relationships between the NIH and Olympiad Open regarding the integration of research in performance support programs? We have a great uh, cooperation with the Norwegian uh, um, sport school or sport high school or in a sport uh, university university uh, we are located more or less at the same place so we have uh, also employees who are experts who are partly uh, employed at uh, uh, the Norwegian uh, sport uh, university and Olympiad Open so they can also get this uh, touch with the athletes and with the expertise and with the practical uh, work of sport and they go back to their uh, university and they uh, they can um, uh, find out more about uh, and give us more answer on the questions we uh, we uh, have okay and I have one last question um, how are you organized to ensure coaches to save time for most common for common meetings across the support sports to share practices and knowledge? Uh, yes, it's a good question. Uh, it's the model, more or less the way we work. Uh, we have uh, um, we gather them in different different settings. Uh, for instance, we have an endurance uh, team with the sport and the summer uh, uh, athletes or winter athletes that, that they're going to the same uh, uh, high altitude camps. Um, and uh, Olympia Open is uh, a meeting place where the coaches meet and the, uh, they have um, talks and uh, informal and uh, and formal talks, and we try to uh, put them together to uh, to exchange uh, practice and exchange uh, thoughts. And they very much like this. Okay, I think we are good with the questions. Again, thank you very much, uh, much uh, Samata, for your answers and for, for your time. It was very interesting. I, and I think we will leave you now to switch to our next speaker. And uh, greetings to Oslo. I think everything is fine there. And uh, that we will leave this specific, special, and stressful time for, for other quiet uh, time, maybe more normal, as you said in, uh, in your introduction. Thank you very much, Elsa Marta, for your time. Thank you. Adel? Our le last guest speaker comes from the Netherlands, Paul Willman. Paul is a full professor of sport psychology at the Vrij Universiteit Brussel and also manager performance behavior at the Olympic Committee of the Netherlands and was team psychologist for Team NL at the 2016 Olympic Games. Paul will present the vision, approach and working method of Team NL with a perspective on supporting high-level athletes, teams and coaches and the associated scientific approach. So Paul, it's your turn, we can see you. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everybody. Uh, and we Adele, you perfect. Ah, très bien. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, having uh, the Netherlands uh, presenting on our program. So we can switch to the uh, presentation. I would like to take you through the next slides uh, to show you what the topics will be that I would like to cover with you. So in essence, uh, the question uh, asked was, can you give us an overview of uh, what TeamNL 
So the Olympic team and the Paralympic team of the Netherlands um, is doing, and uh, especially with regards to research. So what I would like to do is to uh, look at the, the following topics, uh, which include Team NL, who are we, uh, the research, innovation and expertise, and some of the challenges if I still have time. And I would like to recognize uh, the contribution of my colleague Camille Maase, Performance Manager of Research and Innovation in this uh, presentation. As Adele uh, introduced me, I'm also a professor of uh, sports psychology in Brussels, so which means that I also take a, a scientific academic look at what we do. Now, who uh, are we, Team NL? Well, uh, the mission of Team NL is very simple, uh, but straightforward. Uh, in fact, it is more medals. In uh, Rio, we were uh, 11th on the Olympic uh, medal table and 7th on the Paralympic medal table. The goal is uh, top 10 in Tokyo but more medals also in more sports and with more impact on uh, the home front and the uh, sports participation in the Netherlands. So more means uh, also development, which means that we have to look at who are the units or who are the uh, elements or um, aspects of our organization which contribute to uh, research and innovation well, we have the performance management team who are looking at developing and strengthening the lead sports program. We also have uh, the team of experts uh, led by uh, my colleague Camille Maase um, to develop and implement expertise to increase performance. We also have a, a colleagues uh, included in athlete services uh, who provide support and develop and facilitate the team and L career uh, of our uh, Olympians, uh, Paralympians. Um, and finally, we have games operations. Uh, those are the colleagues who are responsible for optimizing the performance climate for every uh, mission, every championship, every games we participate in. So when I go to the team NL experts, who are the people looking at uh, research, uh, innovation, and provide the expertise, I would say that we have uh, generally similar uh, expertise as uh, in the other presentations. And in an alphabetical order, we talk about performance behavior, which is uh, used to be called sports psychology, but which is broad into behavior, and I'll come back to that later on. Performance nutrition, performance technology, research and innovation, sport uh, medicine and strength and conditioning. And a very important point uh, in uh, our uh, support, but also in our approach, is in fact the interdisciplinary approach. So collaborating with the coaches and with the athletes and teams. In this presentation, I'll just illustrate some of the other uh, research uh, items of aspects of uh, my colleagues, but I'll focus on what I call or what we call performance behavior. So when I go to the first uh, topic of research, then uh, research is very clearly uh, driven uh, by the demand, which means uh, we look at measurements, we uh, look at scientific data from the programs, and we collaborate with universities uh, nationally, but also internationally, uh, looking for external funding and working with scientific committees. So some of the uh, aspects of some of the uh, points which have been developed uh, in research from the other domains uh, include sleep and performance, heat acclimation and cooling strategies uh, relevant for Tokyo, and performance measurement in wheelchair, sport, wheelchair sports I'm Sorry, uh, as an example. From the performance behavior uh, domain, which includes uh, lifestyle sports psychology, uh, clinical psychology, and psychiatry, we have uh, some of these topics which we look at. The holistic development of competences, uh, cognitive readiness, uh, and, and an important development in research and talent identification and selection, resilience, uh, mental recovery, and mental well-being of coaches are some of the topics of research which we are looking at from the uh, behavioral point of view. 
Now, just to illustrate uh, one point, uh, this the holistic development of competencies. We actually use what we call a holistic athletic career development model, which uh, I will not go into detail. Uh, and uh, for those interested, uh, I can always uh, uh, communicate the uh, references for the publications of all the uh, research and innovations we are talking about today. Uh, it's a holistic development model which uh, actually looks at how athletes develop, not only at the athletic level, but also the psychological, psychosocial, academic and vocational, financial and legal. And uh, why is that important? Because it shows us, if you look at the uh, chronological development, going from talent development into the elite level, the master level and the post-athletic career, you will see that it identifies some of what we call the uh, important transitions in the development of athletes, uh, the talent development uh, transition, uh, the junior to senior, the uh, elite uh, world uh, European and Olympic Paralympic, and then the post-athletic career or the career end. So it helps us to identify the uh, different challenges and prepare our athletes for those specific transitions. Uh, from a research point of view, this has led to another uh, project which we developed with the University of Groningen and Brussels together with the team NL, is actually identifying from a holistic perspective, so at a similar level, the different competences which are uh, enabling the athletes to progress in their development. And this is, uh, once again, very briefly, a list of the uh, competences uh, which were identified from the uh, research point of view. And I'll just to uh, show you how we use this with our uh, sport federations and programs. It actually identifies for sports specifically which kind of uh, competencies uh, the uh, technical director, the coaches, the talent coaches feel that should be developed in their athletes at an individual level or team level throughout their career and what we call eight years before a possible podium so that they are enabling their athletes to have the psychological competencies they need to optimize their own development and as such uh, also uh, possibly maximize their level of performance. If I go to a second um, point which uh, came out from this holistic model is uh, research we are doing with regards to cognitive readiness. Cognitive readiness is actually looking uh, similarly like the physiological or physical readiness in what area are athletes prepared or unprepared to take the next step in their development. And uh, preliminary research is showing uh, uh, by the way, research we are also conducting together with our Japanese colleagues is showing that cognitive readiness from a psychological point of view is becoming a, a well-established and possibly validated uh, indicator of talent development. If I go to the next uh, aspect, the first one was research, the next one is innovation. Innovation means that we actually are directly involved in the sports program. So we work uh, driven by the demands from the sports programs, coaches, technical directors, um, sometimes individual uh, athletes also. And it's in collaboration with uh, several companies, also universities. Uh, it's developed within the programs, the sports programs, and they go beyond the prototype phase, which means we start and we finalize the formal, the final process so that it's actually uh, enable our athletes to perform at a higher level or develop more optimally. Uh, some examples, sports nutrition, uh, development in bobsleigh or actually in track cycling in the bicycling. From a uh, performance behavior, so psychological, psychosocial point of view, some of the innovative aspects we're looking at include Thermo Tokyo mental I'll just briefly illustrate this. The nudging and behavioral change uh, projects we have. M2M is medal to medal, uh, world level medalist to Olympic or Paralympic medalists. Team excellence, uh, 
uh, intradisciplinary psychological support, so the collaboration between uh, different types of psychologists and career support, uh, as previously also mentioned, uh, the program, for example, in Norway. So just to uh, once again uh, illustrate uh, one of these points, I'll just briefly touch upon the project which is called Thermo Tokyo. Thermo Tokyo is actually a physiological, physical uh, project uh, developed to prepare our athletes for the heat uh, and humidity in Tokyo. But we added from the beginning an, a psychological uh, perspective also, which we call Thermo Tokyo Mental. Mental in the sense it's uh, well sounded, well developed. And we have developed a tool to analyze the athletes' uh, own coaches and staff's own uh, analysis of how they cope with heat um, and what some of the issues are which we need to resolve or help them or provide support uh, to them during uh, their stay in Tokyo on three different levels, the cognitive responses to heat and humidity, emotional and physical related to behavioral issues. And uh, once again, as an illustration, this is a, a, a little spider web we actually use. Uh, I, I see it is, of course, in Dutch, but I'll just illustrate with some uh, English uh, items. It uh, reflects uh, a profile of one of our top level athletes on how she perceives she is coping with heat. And we tested this during uh, pre-test uh, uh, events uh, in Tokyo. So, for example, at the cognitive level, um, so the further out to the, from the center, the more important it is in the perception of the athlete, negative thoughts, lost in details, or uh, problems or issues with uh, decision making. From an emotional perspective, it's uh, getting stressed, reluctant to put in effort or uh, feeling fatigued and nervousness. And from a behavioral point of view, we see that uh, feeling too hot, uh, feeling too thirsty, which is actually a crucial point also from the perspective of nutrition, feeling pressurized physically and exhausted uh, faster. So uh, it helps us to identify the perception of the athletes uh, them, uh, cells in order. And this is just uh, um, a model I'm showing a very simplistic representation of the model we use then to develop their competencies and the support at the psychological and psychosocial level in order to prepare them. And this uh, has been going on together with the physical physiological perspective since almost now three years before Tokyo. So uh, innovation was the second point. The third point is uh, expertise and especially expertise, uh, which means that we are on the field or next to the field, next to the swimming pool or next to the pitch or in the, in the hall. So it means that we have experts on the ground so that they are well known to coaches, to staff, but also to athletes and to teams. And uh, it is reflected in um, a group of what we call embedded scientists we have uh, uh, working in field labs, meaning they're integrated within the sport specific program. And we also have our experts in our five team and health center, uh, centers where they work in an interdisciplinary uh, way. From the perspective of uh, psychology, performance behavior, uh, the points we add in our expertise uh, is a competency-based uh, team of experts. Uh, and I'll just give you an idea of who they are. Uh, mental health, which has been uh, an enormous uh, uh, important point since uh, at least four to five years. Psychological impact of Corona and message, which I'll just briefly illustrate what our approach was. Eating disorders, mental support also for the uh, experts themselves and for the staff and uh, the team psychologists for the Olympic and uh, Paralympic based uh, games. So when I look at the competency based team, so what are we talking about? Well, just once again, a simplified way of uh, showing possible issues at the psychological 
and psychosocial level. And once again, this is very simplified because this is not reality, but it is more for a visual uh, representation. You could go from the green side peak performance into good mental health going to normal health, but then going into submental illness or active mental illness, which means we have set up a system which we uh, provide, in which we provide experts for a daily uh, functioning and enhancing performance on the one hand, but also for counseling, counseling and therapeutic uh, treatment. And uh, if I just... Uh, give you an idea of who are these experts. Well, uh, optimizing daily functioning and enhancing performance is the elite sport, the lifestyle coaches, which we, of which we have 13 in the team, uh, sports psychologists or performance psychologists. And on the other side, or the integrated side, I should say the counseling psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists and psychology, uh, psychiatrists. So those three uh, latter ones uh, provide individual support, while the first two provide daily support or are embedded in the system. And a very important challenge uh, which I found uh, when starting uh, with this uh, uh, team was having not the interdisciplinary, but the intradisciplinary collaboration. So how do you uh, optimize the collaboration between a sports psychologist and a clinical, clinical psychologist working with the same athlete, for example. And that's a point I've raised uh, internationally also to my colleagues uh, in psychology, that not only the inter, but intradisciplinary uh, collaboration is a very important issue. And uh, the development is as such that uh, during the past years, we have been able, these are the five rings uh, representing the five team NL centers in the Netherlands, in each of these centers, we have a similar team of experts, um, a counseling clinical psychologists, sports psychologists, lifestyle coaches working together. So we provide regional support with the same expertise. And just because it was uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning of uh, this uh, webinar, I'm just going to show you or give you a peek on what we did with regards to corona and the uh, anti-corona measures. Uh, first of all, and that was the, the first step we actually took, was uh, increasing the online availability because we couldn't go in uh, live contact, but the online availability of our network of psychologists so that athletes, coaches, staff members, experts, and others could come into contact with our specialists in order to discuss each of the challenges they faced with regards to corona and the measures. A second point in parallel, we started a survey looking at the challenges. And once again, we used what we call a, a holistic perspective, which means we looked at the different uh, elements, not only at the sports level, but also in their uh, total whole life. Some of the points which we uh, came across was uncertainty, uh, motivation issues, uh, issues in daily functioning, for example, uh, one of the points uh, which was very re relevant, some of our athletes were now 24-7 at home, while in normal circumstances they would be uh, abroad for many weeks or months. So adapting to the home setting was a, a crucial one. Career planning, uh, some of the athletes uh, planned uh, to have a, a, a new career or a change in their athletic career after Tokyo 2020 and now we're faced with a, a one-year delay. Subclinical uh, psychological problems were also there. And uh, on the other hand, some of the athletes and coaches said this uh, time of corona provides us opportunities, for example, to work on mental uh, skills or psychological competencies. So uh, using uh, the uh, feedback from the online uh, sessions as well as uh, the survey uh, which we conducted and in collaboration with the Athletes Committee uh, from uh, Team NL, we developed a set of uh, specific fact sheets, recommendations, also podcasts. We also did sessions online on with regards for uh, the psychological impact. How do you cope with those? Uh, it was uh, uh, warm-heartedly uh, welcomed by the IOC in their 365 program. And actually, one of our colleagues uh, in Japan actually translated also those uh, um, 
fact, fact sheets to use uh, locally. Building resilience, uh, how do you do this? Uh, how do you cope with the specificity of corona? Returning to training venues once uh, the lockdown was cancelled, well, uh, but respecting the one and a half to two meters distance, for example, with your coach uh, wearing uh, mouth uh, masks and so on. Um, traveling abroad once international competitions restarted, uh, the changes that occurred uh, in the organization at uh, European or uh, qualifier tournaments. Uh, a protocol with regards to illness and even uh, passing away of uh, possibly uh, family members. How do you cope with this? Um, and uh, which is uh, the point we are currently looking at, of, of course, is the vaccination protocol. And some of the uh, fact sheets are just as an illustration underneath. As I said, also, uh, the uh, podcasts, uh, the videos uh, were also uh, very important. And a final point, which I think was a, a very uh, a specific uh, recognition of the psychological issues and the psychosocial issues of corona, is adding a performance behavior or psychological expert to the central crisis management team of uh, NLCNSF, the uh, Olympic Committee of the Netherlands, to look at some of the measures uh, which were taken and what the impact could be on the psychological and, as I said, psychosocial level. So wrapping up uh, my uh, presentation, uh, I would just uh, like to raise uh, a few of the challenges. And just to give you an example of what are we talking about, well, uh, at research and innovation level, um, the importance of psychology uh, pedagogy, sociology, actually requires us to look at do we need a field lab for human sciences or an integration in which the human science, the psychologist uh, researcher, is actually more uh, prominently uh, uh, present in the teams we already have and more translation into uh, recommendations on the field of uh, scientific research from human sciences, psychology, pedagogy and so forth. And uh, with regards to expertise, um, one of the challenges I uh, am facing is who is the next generation of experts? Uh, where are they educated? Have they enough experience? And uh, we see that even with postgraduate uh, programs in sports psychology, there's still a huge gap in uh, experiential knowledge to work at the elite level. So that's one of the focuses I have for the next years. The specific competence of psychologists uh, is a clinical psychologist always able to work in elite sports? Um, Long-term therapy is not always useful or feasible in elite sports, for example. The interdisciplinary uh, collaboration with experts in medicine, in nutrition, in strength and conditioning, for example. Psychologists need to be much stronger. Expertise, as I said, is not the same as effective implementation. So having experience working in competitive sports, elite sports, Olympic, Paralympic sports, and then finally the role of mental coaches. So in that sense, there are enough challenges uh, to work on. And I hope that uh, with this presentation, I'll give, I have given you some overview of uh, how we approach the scientific approach uh, generally, but also very specifically to the field of performance behavior, psychology and psychosocial aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Merci beaucoup <laughs> for the very nice and the inspiring messages you provided. And uh, we can see how much uh, psychosocial aspects uh, structure the whole approach regarding research, innovation, and expertise. So thank you very much for, for these very clear messages. We have a lot of questions for you, Paul. Uh, we'll try to to provide you with the, the main ones as the lunch time is close now. Uh, but again, thank you, and I will pass the end to Sinead for, for the questions. So our first question is from Paul, who is asking, we, we can see a lot of partnership for the Netherlands team. How much of these kinds of supports helped you in their projects? And could you give us the funding ratio from partnership versus the state of Netherlands? 
Yes, well, uh, that last part, uh, I will leave up to our technical director. It's, uh, I have a view on uh, the uh, financial implications for research projects and uh, who are very important uh, in that field of uh, performance behavior or my colleagues at university uh, who are specialized in uh, very specific domains of psychology. Um, and I must admit that I'm not always looking at sports psychology. I'm also looking at counseling psychologists with expertise in uh, nutrition and eating behavior and eating disorders who are able to work in the field, uh, not only in the scientific approach, but also implement their uh, recommendations in a very practical way. So the first port of call uh, for me is actually colleagues in the, the scientific community but secondly, and uh, that's I think is a, a very important part of my role, keeping in touch with my colleagues, which we call performance managers. Those are the colleagues who are in uh, the programs, in the sports day-to-day -day basis, and they pick up feedback, they pick up points which we need to address. And finally, um, uh, being allowed to join um, uh, master classes, master coach uh, sessions, and traveling with our coaches enables uh, me to have a very, very good view on what the needs are at the uh, applied level. For the uh, final uh, point in your question with regards to the, the financial issues, well, uh, I think that's where my uh, expertise or experience uh, from academia helps me to set up uh, joint uh, PhD programs in order to have a very specific uh, financial budget to work on a four-year basis or a three or two-year basis, depending on the timing we need, uh, and work very specifically on the points which we feel in Team NL are important. And that's a very important point. We actually uh, provide a clear research agenda to our colleagues, rather than looking at what are you doing at the university and this may be helpful or not. So we set with uh, Camille and uh, some of my colleagues a very clear research agenda on the different domains, sport, nutrition, technology, performance behavior. Okay. Uh, our next question is from Manu. In many countries, ethical problems are brought to light, especially in women's gymnastics, artistic and rhythmic. Do the Netherlands teams have specific programs to support your national federation in this topic? Um, once again, uh, an excellent uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, we have faced, uh, I would say, similar, uh, similar uh, events uh, and similar issues in the Netherlands uh, with uh, gymnastics uh, and more specifically female gymnastics. Uh, we have been very proactive together with the sports, uh, the Gymnastic Sports Federation, but also uh, with a center for uh, ethical uh, behavior, um, helping athletes uh, and former athletes to cope with the uh, issues or even trauma they still have with regards to uh, problems they faced with uh, generally adult uh, coaches. Uh, during uh, the last years, uh, there have been several major uh, changes. Uh, that's uh, fairly due to the Gymnastics uh, Federation developing a, a new perspective on uh, how to work with young athletes, but also from our Coach to Coach program with my colleague Francesco Wessels and uh, our technical director Moritz Hendricks. We have been looking at how can we add some of the expertise we have with regards to uh, communication, interaction, psychosocial uh, relationships. Uh, and actually, we use the uh, holistic uh, perspective uh, when questioned in the, at uh, Parliament with regards to what uh, Team NL is uh, looking at, just to uh, identify some of the crucial points where we need to add um, expertise uh, need to add knowledge, but also need to increase the competencies of our young athletes. And with the uh, different competencies which I showed you earlier, the 14 one, we uh, have now been uh, developing a module on a very specific transgressional behavior. 
but uh, towards uh, oriented towards the young athletes, so to help them develop competences which they will need to address possible issues with that regard. Uh, for example, how do, does a young seven, eight, nine-year-old set boundaries, recognize boundaries? How do they communicate? And so on. So we are actively developing uh, modules uh, with regards to transgressional behavior so that coaches within the programs from uh, an early age can work with the athletes or other people, other experts in the federations can work with young athletes on developing those competencies. And the final point is, of course, uh, coach education, where uh, once again with my colleague Francesco Wessels and Kayan Bull, who's uh, involved in talent development, we're looking at what is the competencies knowledge we need to give our coaches in order to avoid this kind of situation. Okay. Uh, next is Teresa. I've got two small questions from her. Uh, do you think innovation could be developed faster by companies? And how would you set appropriate collaboration environment to facilitate smooth sharing of expertise and preserve data privacy? Yeah. Well, uh, I could give you a full hour of presentation just on uh, this question. Um, uh, let me just uh, address the, the first part of the uh, yeah, the first part of the question. Uh, can we uh, develop uh, faster or uh, more easily with uh, collaboration with companies? In, in some uh, respects, yes. Uh, for example, uh, we were uh, thinking about how can we identify nonverbal behavior in order to facilitate coaches to comprehend, to understand what is happening at the emotional level, for example. Now, this is a, a research question. This is not a, an applied at this moment question. But when we then talk with companies, they sometimes have already very specific tools which we can um, uh, use, for example, camera tools, uh, programs for identification of uh, behavior. Um, so companies must uh, be uh, helped to understand what we are looking for. But the main research question, the main question what do we want to have from prototype to the final product must come from uh, our field uh, of elite sports with the experts, with the coaches and technical directors and so on. So yes, and I think that one of the strong points in the Netherlands, uh, and I, um, as you may know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Belgium, but uh, why is the Netherlands sometimes seen as a very productive or very uh, strong uh, nation is because that collaboration in between different segments of society, elite sports, companies, financial, uh, even the government, is very strong and very rapid, which allows uh, the possibility to develop very rapidly the first prototype, see when it works, and then adapt or continue or actually even stop the process if it's not adding. So in that sense, Yes, there's an absolute value to talk with companies uh, because they need our view and what are we looking for, but also for us to understand what's already in the market and which can be adapted to be used in elite sports. And that's uh, a field where uh, my colleague uh, Bernadette van Os, who I've seen is also uh, following uh, this presentation, is the uh, expert to go to. Again, uh, thank you very, very much, Paul, for this uh, very clear answers to very interesting questions and thanks to the audience also for uh, providing these uh, deep thoughts uh, which were uh, quite interesting to address. I think we had very complimentary uh, talks this morning. Again, I want to, to apologize for the very uh, short break with the technical issues. I think that it provided everyone the time to have a coffee break. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. It was a great pleasure to have uh, our five speakers with us this morning. It was very inspiring and uh, very different aspects of performance and a very different uh, model of uh, performance support uh, all over the world. Uh, thanks again uh, to, to Adam uh, Kodiashi, Elsa, uh, Paul, uh, um, and again, uh, I think we had a very great time. 
uh, all together. Uh, and I forgot Nikolai, sorry, uh, which uh, had to leave us after the, the technical issues. Uh, thank you, Sinead and uh, Adele and Adrien for organizing the, this webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoy everything and uh, I will uh, leave Adele to close uh, the session. Thanks again, Paul. Thanks to our five guests for the very interesting and enriching talk. It was a real pleasure to have you uh, all with us today. We hope to be able to welcome you at the INSEP when the sanitary condition will allow it. Thank you also to all listeners. You were between 200 and 2 million to follow this incredible webinar. And of course, thanks you to my INSEP colleagues from the, for the smooth running of this event. Adrien, Gaël, Chenay, Bruno, Jean-Paul, Thierry, and Jean-François. We will meet you in June for a new event that will honor our partners. See you. Bye. Bye.